This week, a souvenir from the papal visit to Cuba arrives in the US. We hear the story of what it's like to be kidnapped by ISIS and survive. And what about women deacons? Hello and welcome to this edition of Vatican Connections. There's a lot going on, so let's get started. This week, Pope Francis approved miracles attributed to two blesseds. One is Blessed Guillaume Nicolas Louis Leclerc. He was a de la Salle Christian brother martyred during the French Revolution. The second miracle is attributed to Blessed Lodovico Padroni, who founded a religious order of men focused on educating the poor and the hearing impaired. So with the approval of these miracles, these two blesseds can now officially be named saints. Caritas Jordan is launching a new program to provide jobs and training to Iraqi refugees living in that country, and they are doing it thanks to money donated by people who visited the Vatican Pavilion at Expo 2015 in Milan. Visitors to that pavilion donated about $150,000. That money is expected to provide enough funds to launch a jobs program and keep it going for six months. Fifteen Iraqi refugees will be employed full-time, cultivating, producing, and selling vegetables and oil. Another 200 refugees will get training in carpentry, agriculture, and the food industry, while another 500 will actually be able to benefit from seasonal employment. Now, it's also expected that the project will become self-sustaining. There are currently about 130,000 Iraqi refugees living in Jordan since the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Many look for work, but the job market just doesn't offer that many opportunities. And we have another update on the Vatileaks trial. The Vatican court is now hearing from outside witnesses. So this past week, Paolo Mieli testified. He is the former editor-in-chief of Italy's Corriere della Sera newspaper. He and two literary agents testified about events leading up to the publication of Gianluigi Nuzzi's book, Merchants in the Temple. Miele and the literary agents said they got calls from Nuzzi asking them if they knew about Emiliano Filippaldi's book, Avarice. The defense for Nuzzi was basically trying to show that Nuzzi and Fittipaldi were not working together to try and harm the Vatican. While on the stand, Mieli said that when journalists receive confidential documents that could potentially be used as blackmail material, he believes they have a duty to publish the content of those documents as long as it doesn't undermine the peace and security of the Vatican. Of course, that trial is not anywhere close to being over yet. Two Vatican officials are making notable trips. First, the Vatican's Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, visited Lithuania this week. He was in Lithuania as the Pope's representative to the country's National Congress on Mercy. He visited the famous Hill of Crosses, as well as a NATO base where the NATO Air Police is stationed to patrol the border with Russia. But the really noteworthy part of his travels is actually how he got there. Cardinal Parolin flew with Ryanair. Now that's a low cost European airline that is incredibly famous for their no frills flying and rock bottom prices. Actually, if you book your flights early enough, you can get round trip tickets from Rome to the capital of Lithuania for as low as 80 euros or just over a hundred US dollars. The flight is almost three hours long. So reports indicate that he didn't do this because of some Vatican directive to fly cheap, but it was Cardinal Parolin's personal decision and it sends a message to other Vatican officials about how they should look at traveling. Now the other notable trip is that of Archbishop Paul Gallagher. He is the Vatican's Minister for Relations with States, 
and he's flying to Venezuela next week. Now his visit is technically not an official visit. He will be there for the ordination of Bishop Francisco Escalante Molina, who was recently named nuncio to the Congo. But if you remember, last week we told you Pope Francis has written to Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro urging him to solve the country's various problems. The Vatican spokesperson, Father Federico Lombardi, told media there are no meetings planned between Archbishop Gallagher and Venezuelan officials, but that doesn't mean they can't happen. And do you remember when Pope Francis visited Cuba and the United States just last year? When he was in Cuba, he was given a statue of Our Lady of Charity of El Cobre, and he was asked to give that statue to a Cuban Catholic community in the United States as a sign of unity between all Cubans. Now, the Pope joked with the American bishops at the time that he didn't want to cause any problems, so he entrusted Archbishop Joseph Kurtz to find a home for that statue. Archbishop Kurtz is the head of the U.S. Bishops' Conference. Well, this week, that statue was handed over to the Hermitage of Charity in Miami, which is an important place for the Cuban community, and it coincided with the 100th anniversary of the proclamation of Our Lady of Charity as the patroness of Cuba. The anniversary was also marked with a mass celebrated by Miami's Archbishop Thomas Wensky, and at the very same time, a mass was being celebrated in Cuba at the shrine of Our Lady of El Cobre. So that chapter of the Pope's Cuba-US trip has finally come to a close. And now with 75 days to go until World Youth Day, the local organizing committee in Krakow has this update on what to expect. Hi, in front of St. Mary's Basilica, I'm Rachel and this is the World Youth Day Minute. If you ask any of the locals what the most famous church in Krakow is, they will say Mariatsky. St. Mary's Basilica. The two towers stand out from the cityscape and was built with the Gothic style in the 15th century. On every hour, a trumpet is played from the top of the left tower, which echoes across the main square. Inside the basilica, you can admire the exquisite beauty of the colorful and ornate details of the many murals, side chapels, altars, and columns, all covered by a painted star-filled ceiling. Nowadays, it is one of the best examples of sacred art. Now let's see what happened this week. Each World Youth Day is accompanied by two symbols, the cross of the Holy Year and an icon of Our Lady that was given to the youth by John Paul II. During World Youth Day, these symbols are always present in the main events. But during the time of preparation, they travel a long distance around the country that is hosting the event. From when the youth of Brazil passed the symbols to the Polish people, they have traveled 19,000 kilometers, which is about traveling from Los Angeles to New York City five times. The symbols will arrive in Krakow on May 20th. In the official choir of World Youth Day Krakow 2016 that will perform during all the main events had its premiere last Sunday on May 8th. The group consists of 300 artists, mainly of students and graduates of musical academies, and in June, the orchestra will join the choir rehearsals. The musical program includes traditional Polish and international songs, as well as compositions prepared especially for World Youth Day. And that was this week's World Youth Day Minute. We have 75 days to go, so don't forget to pray for us, and we'll see you next week. Did you know, this year on May 13th marks 35 years since an attempt was made on the life of Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Square. On May 13th, 1981, a gunman opened fire as the Pope was driving through St. Peter's Square to begin a general audience.
Pope Francis has spoken quite openly about the new martyrs, the Christian men and women who have been killed in the Middle East at the hands of extremist groups like Daesh or ISIS. In recent years, several priests have even been kidnapped by these groups. And while the fate of some of those priests is still unknown, some have survived to tell the story of their time in captivity. Catholic News Service spoke to one Chaldean priest about his time as an ISIS prisoner. The only thing I remember about my childhood is just war. So I don't want our kids to have the same thing like us. For nine days in 2006, the Islamic State group held Father Douglas Bazi of Iraq hostage. He was tortured, and he said the chains locked around his wrists reminded him to pray the rosary. There were a big lock here, and they were chains. And the left of the chains, they were 10. So when I look at the 10, you know, immediately the chains told me, Hello, we are the rosary. But I don't remember when I was praying rosary. Sometime I passed 100, you know, just 100. And just take me, you know, more I am praying, more getting calm, and getting strong. When the Chaldean priest was released, like Jesus, he was asked to forgive. I remember during the day, I was a spiritual or advisor to those people, those kidnapping me. During the night, they used to torture me. The day follow, come again to ask me for forgiveness. Would defeat ISIS. Don't offer weapons, offer books, offer prayers. And by prayers, we are feel that we are not alone and forgotten. It is not the problem just to defeating ISIS. No, the problem is still there. So we have to work for a long term. We have to change the constitution of our countries. If we were able to change that, yes, we can live together again, equal, justice, love. Time now to leaf through Pope Francis's agenda for this week. Last Friday, Pope Francis received the Charlemagne Prize, which is awarded to recognize work done in favor of European unity. Catholic News Service has a look at the Pope's acceptance speech. Sogno un'Europa giovane capace di essere ancora madre, una madre che, ha vita, che abbia vita perché rispetta la vita e offre speranze di vita. Sogno un'Europa che si prende cura del bambino, che soccorre come un fratello il povero e che arriva in cerca di accoglienza perché non ha più nulla e chiede riparo. Sogno un'Europa che ascolta e valorizza le persone malate e anziane, perché non siano ridotte a improduttivi oggetti di scarto. Sogno un'Europa in cui essere migrante non è delitto, bensì un invito a un maggior impegno con la dignità di tutto l'essere umano. Sogno un'Europa dove i giovani respirano l'aria pulita dell'onestà, 
amano la bellezza della cultura e di una vita semplice, non inquinata dagli infiniti bisogni del consumismo, dove sposarsi e avere figli sono una responsabilità e una gioia grande, non un problema dato dalla mancanza di lavoro sufficientemente stabile. Sogno un'Europa delle famiglie, con politiche veramente effettive, incentrate sui volti più che sui numeri, sulle nascite dei figli più che sull'aumento dei beni. Sogno un'Europa che promuove e tutela i diritti di ciascuno senza dimenticare i doveri verso tutti. Sogno un'Europa di cui non si possa mai dire che il suo impegno per i diritti umani è stato la sua ultima utopia. Grazie. On Monday, the Pope met with the Circolo San Pietro, or the Circle of St. Peter. It was founded in 1869 by some of Rome's historic families, and its sole aim was and is to help the most vulnerable people in society. In his address to the group, Pope Francis said, Each one of you is asked not simply go towards the neediest, but to go taking Jesus as you do. It is the way of the disciples, of friends of the Lord. It is about sharing his word, that of the gospel, of repeating his gestures of forgiveness, of love, of giving, of not seeking one's own prestige, but rather the good of others. He also thanked them for collecting Peter's Pence, which is a charitable fund that helps the Bishop of Rome carry out his various charitable works. Wednesday was the general audience as usual and Catholic News Service has details on this week's catechesis. La nostra condizione di figli di Dio è frutto dell'amore del cuore del Padre. Non dipende dai nostri meriti o dalle nostre azioni e quindi nessuno può togliercela, nessuno può togliercela, neppure il diavolo, nessuno può toglierci questa dignità. Penso alle mamme e ai papà in apprensione quando vedono i figli allontanarsi, imboccando strade pericolose. Penso ai parroci e catechisti che a volte si domandano se il loro lavoro è stato vano. Ma penso anche a chi si trova in carcere e gli sembra che la sua vita sia finita, a quanti hanno compiuto scelte sbagliate e non riescono a guardare al futuro, a tutti coloro che hanno fame di misericordia e di perdono e credono di non meritarlo. In qualunque situazione della vita non devo dimenticare che non smetterò mai di essere figlio di Dio, essere figlio di un Padre che mi ama e attende il mio ritorno. Anche nella situazione più brutta della vita Dio mi attende, io voglio abbracciarmi, Dio mi aspetta. Now, before the audience, Pope Francis received Baba Edmund Brahimaj, the leader of the Bektashi order in Albania. Now, the Bektashi are an Islamic Sufi community. Ibrahim Maj told Vatican Radio it was a marvelous encounter and he and the Holy Father together reaffirmed their commitment to dialogue and fraternal encounter and reiterated the importance of the presence of religious communities within contemporary society. On Thursday, the Holy Father had a special audience with 
the women religious who were participating in the plenary meeting of the International Union of Superiors General. And it wasn't your average audience. He spent more than an hour answering their questions. Asked if he would set up a commission to study the possibility of women in the diaconate, he said, I accept it would be useful for the church to clarify this question. I agree. Now he said, as far as he understands though, the deaconesses referred to in the New Testament were not ordained permanent deacons. Their role was to help with baptism by immersion of other women and the anointing of other women. But the Pope said he will ask the congregation for the doctrine of the faith if there are any studies on this. And he also promised to ask the congregation for divine worship to send out a full explanation about why women cannot give the homily at Mass. There were nearly 900 women at the gathering and they represented 500,000 religious sisters from around the world. On Saturday, Pope Francis is scheduled to hold a special Jubilee audience and on Sunday he is to celebrate Mass at St. Peter's for the Feast of Pentecost. And let's take a look now at the resignations and nominations that happened this week. The Ruthenian Eparchy of Phoenix has a new bishop. Pope Francis accepted the resignation of Bishop Gerald Dino and appointed Bishop John Pazek to lead that diocese. Until now, Bishop Pazek was actually Bishop of Byzantine Rite Slovak Catholics in Canada. He will serve as administrator of his old diocese until a new bishop is appointed. As well, Bishop John Kudrick has retired as Bishop of the Ruthenian Eparchy of Parma in the United States. And Chaldean Bishop Sarhad Yosip Jamo has retired as Bishop of the Chaldean Eparchy of San Diego. Both these dioceses will be run by administrators until new bishops can be appointed. Finally, after 12 years serving as Custos of the Holy Land, Franciscan Father Pier Battista Pizzaballa has concluded his mandate as the custodian of Christian holy sites in the Holy Land. He left Jerusalem on April 12th with very little fanfare and is currently living in a monastery in Italy. He was named the custodian of the Holy Land back in 2004. He was only supposed to hold the job for about six years but his mandate was actually extended twice. His successor is expected to be named in the next few weeks, but Italian Vaticanist Andrea Tornelli is reporting this week that those who know Father Pizzaballa well expect he will take a good long while to rest because his 12 years in Jerusalem were not easy ones. In fact, today Franciscans are acting as custodians in many places where conflicts and war are raging, and in some of those places, they are the only Christian ministers on the ground. Now that same report points out that the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, Fouad Toal, has reached the retirement age and we're waiting for a successor to be appointed. It is possible, according to Tornelli, that Father Pizzaballa's name might be considered as a possible successor. It's something highly unusual for a custos of the Holy Land but we'll wait and see. Well, that's all for this edition of Vatican Connections. Join us again next time. And until then, you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, check our blog for updates, or watch us on Roku TV On Demand. From everyone here, thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.